Hello, and welcome to Galen Data's Medical Device Connectivity Innovation Webinar Series. My name is Keith Drake. I'm the Vice President of Business Development for Galen Data. Our topic today is ensuring medical device contract manufacturing success. We'll be discussing how to plan for commercialization success early in the development process. Uh, we've got a fantastic panel today. Mark Semkoff is the President and General Manager of Valtronic. Mark has more than 20 years of leadership experience in the medical device industry. Don Wallace also joins us. Don is the Director of Quality for Valtronic. Don is responsible for leading quality strategy and execution within the organization. Austin Reichert is an area sales manager for Valtronic. Austin has 25 years experience developing business growth with focus on distribution, manufacturing, OEM sales, and services. Gentlemen, welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Uh, let's go over some logistics for the webinar. You can submit your questions for our Q&A session at any time in the questions window in your GoToWebinar console. Handouts overviewing Galen Data and Valtronic are also available for download in your console. We're gonna take two polls during the webinar to learn more about our audience, so keep an eye out for those. And a recording of this webinar will be provided in a follow-up email. Uh, a number of topics today, we're gonna to cover a lot of ground. First, we're gonna ask our friends at Valtronic to overview the role of a medical device contract manufacturer what they do and now how they add value. Uh, we'll then review uh, quite a few best practices, planning and design for manufacturing, best practices regarding supply chain management, assembly testing, and then finally, we'll talk about certifications, audits, and quality. Hopefully by the end of the uh, webinar, you won't be overwhelmed with all the information, but you'll be provided with a clear path for growth moving forward. Uh, just as a reminder, most of you know Galen Data and our Galen Cloud compliant connectivity platform for medical devices. I'll just remind you by saying the Galen Cloud is a turnkey and purpose-built platform for medical devices. It's compliant with all cloud infrastructures, AWS, Azure, et cetera. Uh, the, the Galen Cloud is ISO 13485 certified. It is compliant with a wide range of regulatory uh, guidance, including FDA, HIPAA, GDPR, CCPA, and it's a highly configurable, it provides a highly configurable interface for data access, data display, different levels of access, alerts, and much, much more. Uh, Austin, at this point, I'm going to turn it over to you. Could you introduce us to Valtronic and more broadly discuss uh, the role and the value the contract manufacturer provides? Well, thanks, Keith. It's my pleasure to be a part of this uh, opportunity to talk about the best practices and share with you a little overview of Valtronic. Joined here with my team. I think the, the thing that you need to know is a little bit of perspective, well, how we view the world and what kind of an organization we are. So we've been around a long time. We've been uh, in existence since uh, 1982. And it gives us a really broad exposure and experience level with different medical device uh, uh, practices and different types of, uh, of uh, technology. We've grown to be over 350 employees and, of course, uh, operating now on three continents. You can see our operation there in Solon, Ohio, our headquarters there in Switzerland, and, of course, our uh, our operation in Morocco, which is a great place to do business for, bus for business people and IP protection, and our organization is pleased to be there. So we're on a global scale. And then if you look over to that next slide, as you go forward there and take us over to what really, uh, what really makes us different and, and how do we uh, position ourselves in the market? Well, I would say that uh, one of the things that's critical is our people, and that's critical for any organization. It's your expertise. And our program managers, I give a, a real high mark to then the teams of engineers on the floor, both for experience and their uh, dedication to the job and uh, being degreed. And, and what we do is focus on class two and class three medical devices. That's really our specialty. Mm -hmm. And anybody that needs uh, a small device 
anybody that needs uh, help with a regulatory uh, managed device, small customers or large, that's, uh, that's how we go to market. So roll over and I'll show you those uh, areas that we focus on. What you see there are some examples of, of the kinds of medical devices that we work on and have uh, developed with uh, um, our partners and clients. You see a natural tendency to focus in neuromodulation and stimulation. Anything that's uh, related to implant technology is a core focus for us. Drug delivery is critical. Um, we do a lot of pain medication and pain delivery um, uh, devices. And then a wide variety of imaging and endoscopy devices, along with uh, blood processing and renal devices. So what you see there is a category of markets, but a broad set of experience, a broad set of devices, and I think that's core to, uh, to really Valtronic's value proposition. So if you take us to that next slide. Well, Austin, it, 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 it's fascinating what Valtronic uh, does. We'll explore that a lot more um, from, the, from the audience's viewpoint during our webinar. But let's find out about uh, our audience. Right now, we're going to launch a poll, and we're going to ask all of our participants to participate and tell us what type of organization do you represent? Are you a medical device manufacturer? Or do you provide software as a medical device, that type of company? Are you a device design slash development company? Or do you represent quality or regulatory organization? Or other. If, if you don't fit in one of these first four categories, please select other. So I see a lot of responses coming in. Appreciate that. And give you guys just a, a few more seconds to let us know what type of organization you represent. Medical device, software as a medical device, a device design development, quality or regulatory or other. All right, three, two, one. We're going to go ahead and close our poll. And then with that, uh, let, let's dive into the meat of it. Uh, the best practices in Austin, I'll turn it back over to you. Thanks, Keith. I, I think the best way to frame up our conversation today is using three areas. When you're looking at a contract manufacturer on a broad basis, whether it's for a medical device or other type of, uh, of uh, technology, you wanna make sure of three things. There are many, many things, but if you broadly fit your, your review into these three categories, capabilities and fit, number one, making sure you've got quality built in from the start, and then a good plan and execution of knowledge transfer. In these three areas, if you do your job right and you work with the right partner, they're going to take you through to a, a real successful engagement. A couple of things to highlight here. I'm going to interview my, uh, my senior team here today and ask them some questions to highlight why these things are important. Things like depth and experience in your technology, uh, getting ready and working with the FDA, and then having a strong launch plan. So those kinds of things make a real difference to the success when you pick out your partner. So Keith, if you roll that over to the next slide, I can uh, give you a sense of where this is gonna go. So if you need something built, you better make sure that the contract manufacturer and your partner that you choose has the technology and the skill set. So when you see something on the website, make sure you dive down and figure out if that's real and make sure that they've got the investments in the people and the processes and the technology to get your product built, whether it's a clean room to the level that you need or whether it's a process and a quality management system and make sure that the people, I can't stress this enough, make sure that the people know what they're talking about when you work with them. And with, with that, I'm gonna ask you to move over to that uh, next slide. I'm gonna ask Mark to come online and. Take a listen to my question, Mark. I know that manufacturing is, is something that you're passionate about, and uh, you have a great experience across a wide variety of manufacturers. Can you tell our, our friends out in the audience today, why is it that companies should review their project with manufacturing and design in the program from the beginning? Why should you take a look at that from the beginning? Thank you, Austin. Uh, great question. At the end of the day, 
you're not buying a design, you're buying, your, so you don't want a design, you want a product. You want a product you can commercialize, one that's got the features and benefits and characteristics that your clinicians are, can use to diagnose or, or provide therapy to patients. And so the design is important, but at the end of the day, you want a product. And you don't design products, you manufacture products. And so that's why it's important to think about that from the very beginning. To, to make sure that that in the design you're you're worried about features and characteristics, that's of course important, but you're also managing managing the risks of the eventual manufacturing. And this is making sure you have quality built in, making sure that your processes are robust, making sure that you could, that, that, that the processes can consistently produce the results you need. Uh, make the cost factor. You know, if you don't think about uh, manufacturing up front, you can wind up being um, having some cost issues that, that are not necessarily where you need them to be. Depending on the author and, and who you believe in the literature, between 70 and 85% of all the costs and quality are, are, are designed in. So it's important to think about that at the beginning. Because at the end, if you loop back around to try to gain a cost benefit or gain a quality benefit or change a feature or a, a significant portion of the design in the product which is already being built, uh, the guarantee is it'll cost you time, it'll cost you money, and you'll likely not get to where you need to be if you had done that up front. So really important to, to think about that and have a CM who from day one is involving their manufacturing team, involving their quality team, uh, where possible involving suppliers in, in the supply chain team. So at the end of the day, you get a design that's important, but you also get a product you can manufacture and one you're comfortable bringing to the market and commercializing. And I think what you've uh, what you've managed to stress too in conversations that we've had is design with the end in mind, and Absolutely. look to that next device so that you're always looking forward at how you're going to get there. Correct. Yeah. Indeed, Keith, uh, we can look at that next yeah. slide now. So when when I look at supply chain and when I talk to clients in the field, you know, supply chain seems to be an oh by the way sometimes, mm -hmm. and. Maybe you could give us some perspective on what happens when supply chain is left out of the discussion early. And maybe sure. another way to put that question is, uh, what do you gain by putting supply chain in early? You can look at it either way. So give yeah. us a feel for that supply chain. Sure. So probably the largest value, as CMs offer a lot of value. One of the largest values is, is supply chain, <clears throat> especially large scale assemblers live and die by supply chain chain. If supply chain treats them well, they have flexibility, they have the ability to ramp up or ramp down, they can be cost factors, they can be quality factors. If supply chain is poor, then they really have no ability to, to, to go back and regain that ground. So it's really important to, to not only evolve supply chain, but where possible, let that CM help guide that. CMs have great relationships with, with many suppliers. They know who are experts in the field, they, they know who's best for the application, for the fit, either product fit or the, the product life cycle fit, early stage, late stage, mature, uh, mature stage. Uh, good CMs will, will involve their suppliers in the design. Uh, suppliers are, are experts at their at their mission or whatever the process or product they're making. And so involve them, them early. <clears throat> and, and the benefits are flexibility, and that's in, in time, quantity, able to, to flex supply chain faster or slower depending on how the product uh, is um, <clears throat> being taken up in the market. Quality, better quality through through um, early involvement with suppliers, better quality through just good quality suppliers who know their stuff. Um, a lot of cost benefit and cost leverage can come through using uh, evolving supply chain up front and making sure that the CM is evolved in that size of supplier selection. And last piece is, is sub-tier controls. So part of our, in, in any, any good CMs, um, offering is, is sub tier supplier controls. And so using a supply chain that the CM knows and is, is um, has relationships with, already has that built into the, to the process and or agreements and or the, the business alignment can save time, money, and at the end of the day, um, get the benefit right back to the um, OE manufacturer. Excellent. And I think that last bullet up there is transparency and that yes. um, really makes a difference. You wanna be able to talk openly with your uh, partners and suppliers and have that relationship flow naturally. So take a look at this uh, next thing. This is something that often doesn't get discussed uh, when first uh, when first conversations take place. Many CMs are looking for ways to add value. Uh, they're doing it on the front side. They're doing it on the back side. 
one of the things that's uh, coming to, to the forefront now is assembly of the medical device, not just sub-tier components, not just the printed circuit boards. Talk about what a partner should look for and how do they leverage the, the skills and expertise of somebody that they're going to partner with? Sure. 10-piece prototype brand is not full assembly, so let's be clear about that. A lot of people can, can, can do prototypes. It's often part of the process, and it's a very important part to, to shake out designs and, and, and to shake out initial manufacturing. That's not, that's not full-scale production. And so you're looking for a CM who has the ability to meet your quantity needs, has the ability to meet your quality needs, has the ability to, to, to ramp up and ramp down through the product life cycle. Uh, they must be able to meet that, that full-scale quantity um, from, a, from a, a number standpoint, but a timing standpoint to be flexible. Look for someone who can offer dedicated uh, manufacturing space. And, and I use the word appropriate manufacturing equipment. Doesn't always need to be lights out manufacturing. Doesn't always need to be custom design. However, there are times when you gotta have all that. I mean, you need manufacturers able to discern the differences. No, it's important to apply um, either full-scale manufacturing or, or more generic manufacturing. Look for a CM that's able to plan and plan at 1x, 2x, 3x of your, of your um, state, spoken or uh, stated needs. And finally, this is a really good reason to go visit them. So I, I, a lot of people can make fancy PowerPoints and can put graphs and charts and flow charts and all. Go see your contract manufacturer. Walk in the manufacturing plant, see what you're getting, look at the manufacturing work sales, analyze layout, get some work papers and see how their manufacturing work in, this, in instructions are written. Talk to the quality folks about how they, you know, are involved in the manufacturing and how they do inspections and tests and, and how they release product. So it's really important to, to kick the tires and to witness the actual, actual manufacturing. And the more complicated and complex and the more, um, you know, kind of pieces and parts and nuts and bolts you have, the more important it is to really go and see that manufacturer and assess, can they handle the complexity and can they consistently and adequately meet my product lifecycle needs? Great conversation points there. I think the other thing that I'm hearing resonate is the, the idea of integrating. When you have people that are manufacturing the actual printed circuit board and then integrating it with the different uh, physical devices and making sure that all of that comes together, it's really an integrated approach. And you have one company that understands your device from start to finish. Indeed. So this is something that I've really learned um, in the last couple of years through, through just a raw experience. Testing is something that, that doesn't come up early enough and never seems to come up often enough in my conversations. Yeah. And, and I think you've stressed that in my uh, uh, tenure with you. Can you tell us um, why it's important to really bring that test strategy into the process right up front so that people are working in parallel on the testing? It's one of those things where you're looking for 100% good the first time every time. And that sounds kind of simple. It's, it's hard to do, though. And, and testing is not an inspection. Let me be clear about that. Inspection is important. We do inspection. Testing is, is a functional check to make sure as best we can in, a, in an environment that simulates in use will it really do what it needs to do. Um, and so you're kind of mimicking those, those working conditions and really stressing the, the, the unit or, or the product or the, or the system. Um, a good contract manufacturer will not only offer this, they'll insist upon it. And the assistance is for two reasons. One of them is to make sure it's good. You know, it's just a great way to make sure that you'll get product you need, it, 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 you know, all the features and function work, the characteristics and all that kind of good stuff. I, another important, awful, often subtle and maybe kind of hidden reason is, is the test data and the information you get from testing feeds back into your process loop to control your processes. And so if, if we think about process controls, we think about consistency, reliability, we think about being able to, to push yields higher and higher. Um, that data, that, that feedback data is just, uh, it's, you can't get it anywhere else. You can't get it near as good unless you do the full test. A second piece is, is that, you know, unfortunately you'll have field issues and something's going to happen in the field. That test data is a resonant base of data to go back and bounce what happened in the field against what happened in manufacturing. Do some correlation, maybe find some cause and effect, maybe find a way to, to look at design development and or um, manufacturing process and, and, and find ways to get a more robust solution than just kind of doing the old fishbone diagram or some of the five whys. Having, having a base of data that really integrates into the manufacturing 
is a way to improve the processes, but also a way to, to improve the product um, in the field from a quality and, and, and robust standpoint, robustness. And, and, and like you said, the, the value's in the data these days. It's, yeah, uh, yeah. it's all about the data, and you're certainly seeing that with uh, Galen Data securing it and making sure that that data moves securely. And um, yep. making sure you have an established base of information is really critical in that whole process. Let's um, let's switch gears a little bit. Let's uh, let's talk uh, to the next slide here as we look about um, the first question. Sometimes that comes out of mind is how are we going to reduce cost? How do we get that device to be where we need it to be? And and there really is an opportunity for partnership here between uh, a manufacturing partner and the, the OEM. Can you talk about how CMs and, and partners can work together? What are the things that they do to reduce cost? So cost is always uh, uh, in the front of everyone's mind, especially when it comes to contract manufacturing. So um, it is very important. It, it, it's important because we're all here to make money and you know, you got to make it a cost factor that makes sense for your market or uh, or uh, against competition. What you're looking for is a contract manufacturer that can grow with you through your product life cycle. And so different different times of the, of the product life cycle, there are different cost factors. Uh, so some simple things, learning curve, you know, we, 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 you built 10, you know, 10's worth, you build 100 worth, you know, 100 worth, you know, you, you build 10,000, you, 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 you learn a lot more. And so it's important for a CM to, to recognize that, to be, to be part of the process as we increase productivity, is, is, is our yields go up, that's, that's a, great way to gain cost advantage and, and, and a great way to pass that along to, to customers. It's real um, and it's, you know, it, it's, it's, it's real dollars. A second piece is capturing the, that supply chain. So, you know, if, if a bomb has 20, 40, 100, 1,000 pieces, there are a thousand opportunities for learning curves and yield improvement and productivity gains throughout the supply chain. So it's important not just to think of your CM, but make sure you scale down in, in, that, in that supply chain and have a CM who's already, already able to do, the, do that. And their network is willing to, to, to entertain that and, and to make sure that we're regaining those, those cost advantages. It's also important to think of a CM in a, in a, in a total cost factor. You know, it's, it's easy to see bomb costs, it's easy to see labor costs. That overhead functions are often pretty big cost factors. And you want a CM that can work with you throughout your company life cycle in administrative cost savings. We can find ways to, to share data. We can find ways to streamline processes, find, find ways where where you align those processes across companies and maybe the CM takes some of it that you used to do, maybe you take some that they do, but find ways overall to change that total cost equation. So you're affecting the direct cost above the gross margin line and affecting the cost below the gross margin line. A good CM enters into these, these, these conversations with a really broad view. And again, thinking the total cost equation throughout that product life cycle. Excellent. And, and it really is a partnership in reducing cost. It's not, it's not, uh, we're not opposed to that. A good CM would, would certainly engage in that discussion. So I wanna bring on board here, Don Wallace. Don is uh, our director of quality. And he and I have had discussions over time about how important quality is to the, to the very nature of, of our whole industry. And, and most of our listeners would come into a, an arrangement or an agreement and they would say, well, we demand quality. And uh, they would say, we need uh, registrations and so forth. But there's a couple of things I want to have Don kick off here with uh, with my first question. I want us I want Don to tell us why does having an FDA registration make a difference? Number one, and number two, can you talk a little bit about how a partner should evaluate and what some of the things are they should look for in a supplier audit? Can you tackle those two topics for us, Don? Welcome aboard. Oh, thank you, Hudson, uh, and I will. Um, the first question you asked is why is uh, FDA registration is important for a, a good CMO? Um, the bottom line here is our cus the customers or our clients are looking for someone that can take their uh, product um, from the beginning to the end and, and get them registered. As a good CMM, you have to have FDA understanding and uh, be registered to F uh, the FDA. Um, what that does, it, it allows you as salespeople, CMs coming in and evaluate us and see if we're capable of even understanding what those registrations mean, especially with 21 CFR 820, which is the guidance for FDA. 
He also did directives of 93 and 90, which you see in plantable devices and active devices. Most, most important thing is having the knowledge here, picking a good CMM to understand FDA requirements, understand where the FDA is going. FDA is looking, when they walk in your facility, they definitely want to be able to look at you and evaluate, look at your quality management system. So as a customer, picking out a, a good CM, you want to be able to um, provide the knowledge that you've been through FDA audits, that you understand the requirements the FDA are, is currently looking for. And the second part of that question uh, is, is a very important one also. Um, Austin, it's understanding uh, what makes up a good audit going coming into the facility. Um, FDA is constantly looking for those manufacturing CMs that are bringing product to registration. And to do that effectively, pick those CMs that you know that you can bring it to the finish line and, and, and have a good successful audit. You know, we know we know FDA is out there looking for those contract manufacturers that they worked with before. Hopefully there's not a lot of findings or observations during that time, but there, it, that's standard uh, practice these days. But um, to understand and make sure your, your customers, the, the, uh, picking a good CM and knowing that you can do, um, they understand the FDA requirements and, and that's important. Uh, when you as a RCM like we are, um, you want to be able to um, show that mock audits are part of your everyday life and your quality management system is what you live by. So I think that's a great point there you make at the end, which is have have you and do you conduct mock audits with your uh, partners? I think that's a great uh, that's a great uh, question to take away here from the uh, conversation. So I, I, I think this. Go ahead. No, I think um, you're absolutely right. And I think um, picking a CM, you need to ask the first question, do you perform mock audits? for? Are you prepared for FDA when they walk in the door? Um, typically, it's the FDA will give you three days. What do you do in those three days to prepare for that, uh, that, ex that date that they walk in? And believe me, they will give you only three days, minimum. And I found that over my career that that's the minimum. Um, so be prepared and always get your people on the floor to understand how to answer an FDA question, an FDA auditor. Thank you, Austin. Excellent. So as we look at this um, from, the, from the CM perspective, now let's transition a little bit. What have you found as best practice? Best practice when a partner does a supplier audit. They, what are some of the things that should be automatic that they sometimes overlook? And uh, you, you hit me hard on a couple of these, so I'll, uh, I'll let you talk about them and make sure that uh, when the customers come in for a supplier audit or wherever they go, they're doing these things as a natural, a natural part of their conversation. That's a good uh, thing, and one of the things that you you got it when you pick a good con good contract manufacturer, they need to have a good solid quality management system. And let's understand that FDA. Let's bring FDA into this for a minute. FDA in 2021 is adopting 1345 2016 standards. They're gonna they're all out there getting trained to become certified and auditors the 1345-2016. So when they come in, instead of their three-inch book that they go live by, they will come in and audit you to your own requirements. So what does that mean? That means understanding your system, making sure your system is compliant, understanding the key components of a good quality management system. You're looking at your CAPA system. You're looking at training and competency. You're looking at validations. One of the things that FDA brings into the equation is good validation master plan. Do you have one? Making sure that you're picking a contract manufacturer that understands validation and understanding the, the training requirements for that. And what I would say is, Evaluate those. 
because those are the number one items, CAPAs, validations, training. Those are the key components what FDA is looking for. And even your auditors are looking for. Suppliers are coming in, constantly in evaluating your quality management system, making sure those talk to each other, make sure they are you're in compliance with those each other, and do what you say you're doing in your work instruction procedures. Excellent. Excellent. So, so when you, uh, at the end of the day, a supplier chooses a, a manufacturer or a partner that they want to work with, what are some of the documents and things that they should ask about the internal operation? I'm thinking about uh, software systems, uh, paperless uh, programs, yes. disaster recovery. Talk a little bit about how to look for those things and what questions to ask. Yeah, when you go into a, any uh, a picking out a good uh, CM, you want to make sure that they have a good ERP system. Um, either that be in Oracle, SAP, there's a number of uh, ERP systems out there, but one, make sure that your ERP systems talk to each other in your QMS system. Make sure that you're drawing the right information out of those uh, systems. Making sure that you're picking the uh, contract manufacturer has a good cha engineering change uh, notice process. And what does that mean? Customer gives you a change for a Rev A to a Rev B. How do you handle it? Making sure that it gets to the process, gets to the floor, making sure people are trained to it. And of course, everybody has that issue of disaster preparation recovery. What happens when the lights go out, storm happens? What are we going to do? How are we going to take your product and be able to still manufacturing and at the end of the day get you your product and without missing a beat? Those are all important questions. Picking out a good CMM, a good CM, and, and, and dive into the details of your ERP systems, your ECR systems, your disaster recovery, and also what kind of system do you have for routing the product to the uh, um, through your manufacturing floor? Can they do it? Are they paper? Are they paperless? Mm -hmm. One thing I have to say, um, with FDA requirements, a lot of FDA agents will, or auditors will come in and say, are you going to an e-router system? And that's a paperless system. Ask your CM if you're going to a paperless system. It, it prevents um, documentation errors, human errors in there, and once you get the electronic format down, you you are ahead of the curve what FDA is looking for. They want that paper system, and so does 1345-2016 uh, auditors. They want you to go that, that route. Excellent. So it's really about communication. It's about measurement. It's about preparation. It's about making sure that the systems are there to handle the, uh, the uh, introduction of the product and really work on a long-term partnership because quality is just like we said about manufacturing. It's an integrated system, right? We want to make sure that it's integrated with our design process. We want to make sure it's integrated with production and also test and shipping out the door. So great, great conversation um, about quality and uh, watching the time here. Let's go to that next slide. And I wanted to, to give you a couple of ideas on, on just some uh, comments from the field. Um, yeah. The thing that uh, has interested me as I've as I've worked in the CM space and watching how customers approach uh, their manufacturing partners to determine how they're going to go forward, the first thing I think you look for after you've done that uh, audit and made sure that the capabilities are there and you've talked to the people is mm -hmm. really uh, putting together a strong launch plan. That transition plan and having a checklist and build in the uh, the process of uh, good communication and regular communication. If your CM partner doesn't want to talk to you every week, I would say that uh, they don't have your best interest in mind because really mm -hmm. there's so much that happens day to day on the floor, week to mm -hmm. week, um, you really need that conversation. And I think the other thing that sets uh, different uh, manufacturers apart is access to executives and floor people. You want to be able to reach out and talk to those people directly, email, phone, regular conversations, 
make sure those executives are involved in the business and can talk to you because they are a great resource. So communicate, site visits, make sure you have a relationship and, and make sure that you have um, really the documentation that makes it possible to, uh, to really grow the business. So I think we come to a time when we're gonna summarize this conversation. And, and if I did pull together what, uh, what Mark and what Don and I have shared with you, it's really focused on a long-term partnership. We're working with your most prized possession and we treat it that way. And, and you have to feel like we're committed to that and we're gonna be around for the long haul. So look for a company that's committed to that partnership. I think the other thing is expect excellence and prepare for challenges. Um, it's, it almost sounds cliche, six months after COVID shut down most of the economy, who would have thought? But having the idea to build in um, creativity and flexibility into the organization, even though you expect execution is critical. And the last thing, uh, if Don and, and Mark tell me one thing, it's communicate, communicate, communicate. Yeah, build right. trust with your customers and make sure you're ready to do business with them. I think as we've talked through this, we've probably stirred up some questions. I think we're coming to that point, Keith, where we take a look at uh, what kinds of questions we've stirred up and give people a chance to quiz us on, uh, on what we're talking about here. Well, Austin, you mentioned uh, one of your bullet points here, focus on building a long-term partnership. Let's see where our audience is with their potential partnerships with a contract manufacturer such as Valtronics. So we're gonna go ahead and launch our second poll today. And we're gonna ask the question, what is your contract manufacturing outlook? The first choice is your design for contract manufacturing is already implemented. You know what you're doing. You've, you've taken into consideration the vast majority of what we've spoken about today in terms of best practices. You're in good shape. Second choice, you are definitely thinking about contract manufacturing, but you have not taken any definite action yet. Third choice, you're not sure where to begin. You're not sure where to begin planning for contract manufacturing. And then lastly, you may not be a good candidate for contract manufacturing. So see the uh, poll answers are coming in, it's optional, but we appreciate your input. Uh, choice one, you're in great shape. Choice two, you realize the importance, but we've given you a lot to think about today. You've taken no definitive action yet. Choice three, you're not sure where to begin. And then choice four, you're not a good candidate for contract manufacturing. So we'll go ahead and close out our poll. Thank you everybody for participating. Um, before we get to the Q&A, let me suggest to our audience what your next steps are. We've really covered a, uh, a wide range of best practices, things to think about. So I would ask you to think about what we've discussed today and think about where you are in your device life cycle. What contract manufacturing issues could you be addressing today, regardless how early stage you are? There are there is so much to think about down the road that if we think about it now, you'll be more effective and efficient when it comes time for contract manufacturing. The second question is, have you considered cloud connectivity or device development? We've touched on that a little bit today. It is becoming cloud connectivity an increasingly important part of your medical device and your medical device ecosystem. So think about where you are in cloud connectivity. And then thirdly, let us know. Let Ga if Galen Data can help you, if Valtronic can help you, you see our contact information there on the screen. Uh, more than happy on, on either front to have a preliminary conversation with you to see where either company may fit in your plans and your strategy right now. Um, I will make an announcement for our webinar next month. We have a, a president, principal and president and founder of OmedTech. OmedTech is a uh, consulting organization that we at Galen Data use uh, very much to our advantage. Stephen Ford, president, is going to be joining us. And the title of the webinar is Pathways for Successful Medical Device Quality Audits. We're going to be taking a deeper dive into both internal and external audits. The, the best audit, and Don, I know you'll especially agree with me, 
is the one you don't have to prepare for because every day, every hour, your quality processes are setting you up for that audit. There's no, la now certainly there's some last minute nits and bits to take care of, but by and large, the more you practice during your normal course of business, quality processes, the less preparation and the more successful the ensuing audience. So we're gonna take a deep dive into that concept with Stephen Ford next month, October 27th, which is a Tuesday. All right, so time to get to our Q&A session. Um, I will ask everybody to um, submit your questions in the questions window in the GoToWebinar console. And I'll remind everybody that a recording of this webinar will be provided to all registrants via email. We've got questions coming in already. Golly day, this is great. Um, uh, first question, Don, uh, I think this one's probably best for you. Okay. What happens at a contract manufacturer when they receive notice of an FDA audit? We were just talking about this a little bit. Maybe you could dive in a little bit deeper. Do you have time to prepare? Who gets notified? How much notice do they give you? And does the partner get notified? Great question. Great, very good question. Um, typically, uh, when an FDA audit is about to happen. They give you about a three-day window. What does that mean, actually? What what time do you have to get ready for it? At that point, you, you're going to let the organization know that this audit's going to happen in three days. Prepare the front and back rooms that you've been doing mock audits the whole time. Contact your customers that are re you're required to contact um, for per your agreements that you have in place. Um, new customers, um, existing customers, they need to know. It's a requirement um, that you contact them. And I think the key here is getting that communication to your, your customer, your client, making sure your organization knows that in three days you're gonna have, that it's going to be official. They're going to walk in a door, whip out their badge, show you their guns, and say, okay, we're ready to hear it. We'll get you started. And uh, the key here is, Confidence, it'll go well if you get the front and back room set up and making sure you have your subject matter experts at hand. All right, uh, next question, this comes from uh, Bob from Boston and Mark, maybe I'll toss this one your way. What are the issues to consider when starting with small quantities of manufacturing a medical device in house and then transitioning and scaling to a large uh, to large production quantities. Thank you, Bob. So um, many issues, like I said, a, a small production run and a prototype uh, production run is not necessarily full-scale manufacturing. Um, often the significance is, is not just the fact that I'm using uh, a, a table and some hand tools. It's it's things like, are, is, do I have a test error? Is my test part of my, part of my process? Do I understand step one, two, three, four, five? And so really have a clean routing that, that guides that operator through the, the, the assembly process or the, or the construction process so that at any step of the way, the operator understands goodness and I can detect I've done it right. And so if I have to pass it to Don or someone else, I know I've passed along a good product. And so you, you, you kind of build that into the process and it's some knowledge as well as the operator training. Um, and, and as you think about higher and higher volumes and, and larger scale, that's where it's it, you need to worry about a, a the appropriate use of uh, customized jigs and fixtures, the appropriate use of, of integrating workstations and testing, the, the, the appropriate use of, of some ergonomics, you know, and, and how long will an operator stand or sit at a workstation and do the same operation day after day. And so it's, it's um, you know, and included in there, I say, is process control so that I know that if I, I do certain things, my process will, will, will put the, the, the right product down, validations, qualification, verification, that sort of thing. And, and it's in the more and more you're worried about speed, the more and more you're worried about volume, and the more and more complex you see, the the higher the the requirements are for for a lots of validation, good good clear validation, and then making sure that man machine interface really works for you. If I might, I, I um, the thing that I see is the 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 big transition point is making sure that supply chain is locked in, because sure. oftentimes there are yeah. Parts and and issues in the supply chain 
that just won't turn on a dime. So good communication about forecasts as you ramp is critical to involve that supply chain, the purchasing team, the buyers to make sure that they've got your product scheduled in to meet that demand on the floor when you say go. And I think you heard that uh, resonate in the earlier conversation as well, why it's so important. So it's a great question to, uh, to highlight that. So this next question, uh, Don, Mark, I'm not sure who wants to field it. It's a two-parter. Uh, supply chain setup question. What MRP system does Valtronic use to manage the supply chain and manufacturing? Also, how long should a contract manufacturer, how long do they or how long should they keep customer documentation? You want to get the first one, Mark? Sure. <laughs> We use SAP. We use an SAP system. Yes, I can say. Yeah, we and it's it's integrated throughout our our um, um, financial system, of course, and in, in our, our customer ordering, our our MRP and manufacturing control system, all all linked to, to SAP. All of our lot traceability, you know, receiving records, all this stuff's housed in SAP. So, uh, so uh, uh, you know, so uh, the order comes in, it flows through SAP. All the data is captured and and. Um, where appropriate feeds into to Don's QMS stuff. We, we do some some data warehousing, um, yeah. so that you know, it, it, SAP is our it, is our backbone and runs and it runs our yeah. and then The second part of that question is um, you know retention. Um, when you look at our good CM CM, you want to make sure that they have a matrix involved. How long do they keep every part of the QMS system, product uh, specification drawings, everything that needs to be uh, lumped them, lumped in together. Um, we most time, most of the time, you're going to see the product retention to be uh, the life of the product until it's yeah, until it's at, until it's end in ten years plus. So your your product ends this year. We're going to keep that product retention for another ten years. So your retention retention process is dictated by the customer. But also, we have our own requirement. If you're a good CMM, have their, has their own requirement, and that's typically the life of the product. Uh, very good. Another question. You talked a lot about the development cycle. If I am past development and into production, do you have experience in bringing on mature products, including helping me steer through the FDA? Absolutely. Um, one, of the, one of the things that we, we uh, pride ourselves on is Making sure our equipment are, are is validated and our process uh, is robust. Um, taking a mature product through the system, making sure everybody's trained and competent in doing what they're supposed to be doing through OJ hundred job training. Making sure that that's that training is continuous throughout the year. New people come on board. New onboard uh, people. They they're trained. You got to make sure that when you pick a good CMM, a CM, I don't like keep saying CMM, but CM, you want to make sure that your the the product is going through the process, it's yielding the right yields, and you're driving it to success so this the customer can get their um, product launched on time because they have a set time by the FDA. And and driving home um, success for them, and making sure that we're doing what we're a good CM is doing what they're supposed to be doing. Um, I, I know we I talked several times during the webinar on the issue of cost. Cost is always at the forefront of of everybody's mind. Austin, for you, let's drill down a little bit. What are the key documents to send to your partner to get the most complete and accurate quote back to them? Talk us through that a little bit. Well, I, I think the, uh, the there's a there's a tongue in cheek answer, which is, what do you need from me? And the answer is, what do you have? The uh, the conversation with my engineers is always more is better. But I think the uh, the critical success factors are a good uh, bill of materials. So a good bill of materials is not just a part number that you designate. It's also the manufacturer's part number. It's a descriptor for the manufacturer. It's a source that you get. And oftentimes a costed bomb, believe it or not, is something that's really important because if you have a better cost than we do, we'd happily incorporate that and any good CM would do that for you. 
The idea is the bond cost is a set of parts and the better you can negotiate it, whether it's you as a partner or us as a supply chain manager is to your advantage. Um, assembly drawings, work instructions, test mm -hmm. equipment, uh, uh, design, anything that you have related to test data and testing for uh, electrical safety. All of that documentation accumulates into a doc package. And I guess I would top it off. If I were going to say I, what, what makes this meal complete, it's a sample. If, if you can provide your, your contract manufacturer, whoever that is, with a gold sample or a sample that they, that they can sit around. I don't know if you've ever seen a bunch of engineers sit around a table and take something apart. But they'll look <laughs> at it. And it They'll work with it and ask why, and, and it really helps them to validate their questions quicker, and it gives them a visual. So drawings are important, Gerber files, of course, CAD files. You put that into a doc package, your CM should be able to provide you a checklist. And that's the way I would leave it is. The more organized and the more methodical you feel that this uh, contract manufacturer is working with you, the better off you're going to be down the line. Mark, can Valtronic use specific vendors that we choose for our device, and can Valtronic use custom parts? The answer to both is sure. I mean, the short answer is, is yes. Uh, we, we have, of course, have our own supply chain and people we've liked and worked with for a long time. And um, depending on, on what it is and, and what you're wanting, we may suggest our own supply chain. Uh, again, people we have relationships with and people we know well and are able to provide cost factors and flexibility factors, have some expertise in design development. However, if, if you have a, a specific supplier you like and want to work with you, we, we, we'd love to use them. Um, you know, we'll start their, that, that, that relationship and, 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 and we'll partner on that because, you know, they often have a relationship with the, with the customer. As far as custom parts, sure, we can, um, we have our own, own supply chain for a, for a host of custom products. Uh, if you have one, someone you like, again, we'd love to use them or at least compare them against ours and we can together make a choice on, on who we go forward with. But we can, we can get custom parts and custom tooling and, and custom equipment, and the, whole, the whole gambit of, of, of customized. Um, and, and, and part of what, you know, the, at the end of the day, it's not our product, it's your product. So whatever makes best sense for you guys, uh, for, sorry, for, the, for our customer client, we're going we're gonna to agree to. Um, our, our pride uh, pride is not necessarily in the product, it's in how we served you and how we've allowed you to, to see your business grow and flourish. And so if, if one of the things you need is a, is a supplier, a custom supplier, we have our own, we'd love to use yours though. Flexibility. John will make sure that uh, yes. they meet the supplier quality audit functions, right? We go out and make sure those guys are audited. Yeah. Well, the good thing about it is when, when a customer wants us to use their, their supplier, we bring them into our our uh, quality management system, and we'll we'll control the development if there's any issues going forward. And and one thing about uh, the quality management uh, supplier quality management system is in ensuring that those uh, suppliers are meeting the needs and our requirements of our QMS system. Don, during our conversation earlier, you mentioned front room and back room. What's the difference between front room and back room? Good question. Um, what you want to do is ensure that when you have a front and back room, and what does that mean? That means you're going to have two inspectors usually show up, FDA inspectors show up. Sometimes you have one, typically it's two. You have a, um, a, a quality management representative there, and then typically you have a scribe, right, sitting next to you. So when you field the questions from the inspector, the scribe will um, right, uh, type down the question, it gets transferred to their back room where your subject matter experts are there. They then field the question, get it, a, an answer to you, and have it back to the front room within typical five to seven minutes. That's your goal. That's why mock audits are so important, to field a question, get the answer to the front room and uh, field the uh, inspector's questions. Now, what's in the back room? You have a subject matter expert, you have engineering, you might have, you definitely have document control, you have the, um, sometimes you have the client 
hovering around. Uh, they're in our third room over there. If they need to have questions to the, the clients themselves, that's why that call is so important to make. Once you get the call from FDA, they know that uh, they're they're subject to get a phone call, or sometimes they come on site here and help assist us through the FDA audit. So you have a typical small um, man contract manufacturer. You might have 10 people in the back room. You only have two people that are fielding questions and getting those questions answered to the FDA auditor. And maybe even a side room where the client is. That's the yeah, third room, room but we room, side room. Okay. A lot of those customers don't come in. They would rather have a phone call. We're at the hop phone, and they're like, "Good luck." And then, <laughs> and then, and then you can you can give them a call if you have a question about their product. Sounds Usually like their engineering their traffic function. controller to to orchestrate that square dance. Huh? Here Here's you got a question. It. Uh, what it. is typically the lead time from first contact? to getting a product manufactured per FDA guidelines? Typical timeline? Well, that's depending on the submission to the customer. The customer will submit. They usually have anywhere from three to six months to get it. FDA, FDA might come back uh, with a, a bunch of questions for them, or they'll do an on-site audit, which is sometimes a PA audit. And if they, they go in there and they do their audit and they Check the boxes. They'll come to Veltronic or your a contract manufacturer, and then within that typical time frame, the FDA shows up. Usually, it's no less than two weeks. To be mm -hmm. honest with you, uh, you're going to have FDA in there every day for two weeks, and then they're going to check off all the boxes. And at the end of the day, you're going to be able to um, answer their questions, make sure that they're satisfied with your answers. Making sure you can, if you get a 483, you have 30 days to comply, up to 60 days. But typically, um, if you get it done in 30 days, you'll get a, a, a closed EIR report from them. And that seals the deal for the customer. They can uh, launch their product once they get it approved. I'm going to combine two questions because they both discuss documentation and toss the earway, Austin. What does a good documentation package contain? And what are the preferred methods for transferring documentation and what formats are recommended? Austin, are you on mute? Sorry about that. There was some background noise. Uh, it's a great question that we touched on a little bit before, which is you, you begin with a bill of materials and then you mm -hmm. build the documentation that helps you assemble those and the CAD and Gerber files combined together with assembly instructions and, and drawings that help you put that together. Any test material that you have related to the device or testing that you've done is always included. And really any regulatory or, or information you have about uh, quality and the requirements that you have for the, uh, for the document or for the product to be built. And, and most often what happens is these files are fairly large. Um, Veltronic is sophisticated and all CMs, it's a, it's a real tribute to internet technology today. You can drop them in a Dropbox uh, arrangement. You can securely transmit them from Google Docs. You can zip those files and send them over in a series of files. And the project engineer at the company that you're working with will accumulate those. They'll digest them and review them internally then they'll give you a clear sign that they've got all the documentation. And I think the other thing that's critical is after you dump this product into the Dropbox or you put it into Google Docs, prepare for a document review and an engineering review of your, con of your device because it just doesn't translate fully until you've had a conversation. So best practice is to make sure that you transfer the information and you create a, a relationship with the people evaluating the document package, and then the uh, quote starts to move its way forward. So this is a, a shared opportunity to really get information in and then deliver a great quote to the customer uh, no matter where you're doing business. Thank you for that. Well, we have uh, run out of time. That was a quick hour. I want to thank our panelists for a very engaging discussion. Thank you, guys. And, and also thanks to our audience for attending our webinar today and for your very insightful 
questions from our audience. Um, as a reminder, Galen Data stands ready to help you with your cloud connectivity needs. Our Galen Cloud platform provides turnkey connectivity for a wide range of medical devices and data resources. It includes access control, onboard analytics, security protections, and is regulatorily compliant. Uh, we look forward to seeing you uh, next month and at future Galen uh, webinars, Galen Data webinars. And please let us know if there's anything that either of these companies uh, can help you with before then. Thank you, guys. Thanks to our audience. Thank you and goodbye.